Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of the SEM Rush webinar. My name is Patrick Whalen, and I'll be your host. It's Tuesday, September 27th, and joining us is Clayton Wood. Clayton is the founder and CEO of Identity Labs, and prior to that, he was a managing partner at a number of the largest digital marketing brands. He's a published author and speaker and has traveled the world helping webmasters and marketers drive traffic and stay passionate about what they do. In his presentation, he'll be revealing strategies to double your rankings in 90 days. Uh, but before I turn things over to him, I just want to let you know the webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be made available at youtube.com slash semrushhq, and we'll be doing a Q&A session at the conclusion of the presentation. So get your questions in the GoToWebinar chat box uh, as soon as you think of them, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. You can also follow along on Twitter with the hashtag SEMRushLive, or tweet us at Clayton Wood and at SEMRush. Uh, also, everyone in the audience today will receive a two-week trial of the SEMRush Guru platform. And I'll have some more information on that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Clayton, how are you doing over there? I'm doing good, man. I'm in San Francisco, California. We have this late, very late summer, so it's been cold through July and August, and now just at the end of September, it's finally uh, in the 90s here. So we're seeing summer, and everybody's out and, and enjoying it, and I'm excited about uh, this webinar today for a few reasons, because SEMrush has been a, a staple tool for me for the last decade, and number two, because I did this um, this a, a speech focused around these hacks in Brazil uh, during actually during the same week as the Olympics, and there was about 1,500 people in the audience, and it went really well. So I wanted to bring this to the SEMrush audience since the tool was the main focus of uh, any of these hacks. So I'm excited, man. How are you? Are you're on the East Coast, right? Yep, other side of the country. Always uh, interesting to hear the the weather differences. We're actually starting to get cool uh, around here, you know. Um, air conditioning is <laughs> getting turned off, you know. Crack the windows at night, but pulling out those long sleeve shirts and, and getting ready for for proper autumn, I guess you'd say. Sounds good. Well, I I see that there's uh, quite a few people uh, joining us on the call, so. Patrick and I just wanted to do a couple of introductions and say hello while everybody's joining. Um, is there anything else that you want to mention, or, or am I off to the races? I, I think we're in good shape. You know, we've had you here a few times, and you always do a wonderful job. So uh, let's let's dive right in and get into this exciting information. Well, thanks so much, Patrick. I appreciate you saying that. It's uh, it's always always a pleasure. You guys have an awesome, responsive crowd. I love the SEM rush crowd because they tend to be a little bit more technical in nature. You know, they're at the point where you guys are all at the point in the marketing where you realize that some things you have to deep dive into, analyze, and sort of extract uh, analysis that can help you grow your business. Um, my experience, and I'll just introduce myself quickly, is uh, running SEO companies. I'd, I've had a few SEO companies have been fortunate enough to be involved in some really exciting uh, success. Um, but in terms of the technical work, um, it's things like on-page optimization, backlinks, um, you know, uh, anchor text diversity, keyword density, all these things that go into reverse engineering uh, Google's algorithm, which is almost impossible to do these days. <laughs> but um, there are uh, some very obvious things that I see people missing almost nine times out of ten. Um, and those are what I'm going to cover today. So what we did uh, with my group here in San Francisco is we took a look at our entire sales funnel with all of our clients that are either asking for SEO or need SEO or are in negotiation or we've done website audits for. Um, we looked at a couple of principles that are, uh, that are sort of basic uh, to an SEO standpoint, but that seem advanced to the outside world, and we implemented those across our entire sales funnel, and we'll show the results of that today. They worked 
really well. Now, on the surface, you guys might know about Google Webmaster Tools and backlinks and stuff like that, but there's a couple of very detailed idiosyncrasies that I'm going to cover today that we've found that if you follow these, um, you're going to double your rankings and double your traffic. Uh, 90 days is a good sort of litmus test to do that in just because SEO is momentum driven. Um, as you all know, I'm sure. Uh, I always give the analogy that it's like pushing a car. It's really hard to push the car when you're first starting, but once that car gets rolling, it's very hard to stop. So this is what we're going to be talking about today is getting that momentum going um, and doing it fast. And 90 days in an SEO world is pretty fast. So I've run a bunch of SEO campaigns, um, well over a thousand I'm sure, and have looked at a lot of data. Um, and today I'm going to cover the top five hacks that will double your rankings and double your traffic. So I've displayed this information like a roadmap. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is the road to doubling your rankings in 90 days. If you follow these exact steps and exhaust them, you're going to see a lot of organic traffic. So the first thing is, and I've got to cover this, um, is baselining your rankings. And I'm sure uh, probably most, if not all, of the crowd knows how to do that. SEMrush is a great tool to baseline your rankings. What you want to do is uh, just find out where you're ranked, pop your domain into SEMrush, and look at all of your rankings. All right, and what we're going to work from here today are a few different things. Uh, a spreadsheet, uh, SEMrush, and some of the Google tools, Webmaster Tools and SiteSpeed. Um, so in this case, if you want to keep a hard copy of your rankings, I always recommend that. So plug in your, um, plug in your domain to SEMrush and then export that ranking uh, view, and then you'll see what uh, what keywords you're ranking from currently and what you want to do with that keyword list is take it and analyze which ones are appropriate uh, for, for your uh, website for you to convert traffic or uh, to, to rank for branding for. I'm sure everybody listening has an idea of what keywords they want to rank for and when you export the, the keyword ranking list from SEMrush you may see those keywords, you may see some other keywords that aren't relevant because SEMrush takes an account for everything that you rank for. And what you want to do is export that list and then remove anything that's not relevant so that you end up with a curated sort of high target value list of keywords. That might mean that there's 20 keywords, 30 keywords, 50 keywords, maybe 100 uh, depending on your website size. But if you're on this webinar and you're using SEMrush, I'm assuming that you guys have a good handle on what keywords that you want to rank for. All right, so that's the starting line. Once we get started, we know where the keywords, what the keywords are that we want to rank for, and we know what position we're at with those in Google organic search results. So if you've got that on a spreadsheet, you want to have the date by them, which I think uh, SEMrush gives you the date already when you export the, the spreadsheet. And you just want to keep that, all right? Now, what we're going to do today is just go through these different hacks, and then 90 days from now, you'll want to run this same report again, um, and, and you'll be able to see what positions have gone up and moved around and how much. And then, obviously, overlaying the traffic, just taking a look at the Google Analytics traffic or whatever traffic tracking system you use in 90 days and seeing how that... Um, that traffic increases correlate with ranking increases. Of course they do. So uh, let's start with hack number one. Uh, the, the first place on our roadmap here to doubling your rankings is Google has a mantra. You're not following Google's mantra and it's hurting your traffic. And this is sort of the, the marketing blip for this hack. And if anybody has been around Google or listened or you know, paid attention to what Google's overall theme is. I guess it could be argued a little bit, but their main theme with search is speed. Um, you know how at the very top of the, uh, of the Google search results, they still, after a lot of iterations in their uh, user experience, they still choose to put 
results one through ten of you know fifty million in zero point zero zero two one seconds or whatever it is. The reason that they keep that up there uh, is because they want to show that they're the fastest search engine, and speed is such a massive play for Google. So they understand that if they start slowing down or they get the reputation that they don't provide the quickest results, people will go elsewhere to, to look for results. So what we're talking about here for Google's mantra is speed. A couple of uh, years ago, uh, Google came out with, um, and it was a lot of, uh, Google came out with a algorithm update and there was a lot of research and testing that was done about site speed and the big question was does site speed affect your rankings and it does. It's wild because um, site speed was affecting rankings more than everybody sort of let on um, and uh, what we want to do or what we did is we took a look at most of our clients or if not all in the sales funnel um, and found out what their site speed was and that's what I'm going to show you today one of the things that I'm going to show you today so to check your site speed and you, you know you might be a uh, a seasoned webmaster um, but check your site speed what you'll learn is that there are some really interesting hacks that you can do to get this site speed up and when you do just improving the site speed uh, will increase your rankings almost immediately so the tool that I use, there's a few of them, but I use uh, the, the official Google tool. It's PageSpeed Insights. So if you just search in Google for PageSpeed Insights, you can see that there's a, a, a URL, an Omnibox here, that you can just uh, put your URL in and then click Go, and it will actually run uh, the site speed on website. Now, I've got an example here on my screen um, this is growthmarketingconference.com. It's a conference in San Francisco that uh, has a couple of big uh, weekends um, for the marketing industry um, and involved in it. So I wanted to check this uh, website and it's got two different settings. One is uh, desktop and one is mobile. And what it shows is that Google judges your site speed based on a couple of different factors. Um, and actually gives you advice on what you should fix or change and how bad that problem is. So this particular site is scored 88 out of 100. Now the interesting thing with site speed is that it's almost impossible to score 100 out of 100. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever seen, I don't think Google scores 100 out of 100. But anything from 80 upwards is marked in green. So typically what we want to tell our clients is you work at this until you're above 80. Um, and this one is 88 on desktop. So that's pretty good. Um, on mobile it's a little bit lower, 68, and then has some some warnings here. And I'm going to go through those warnings because what we found out after testing tons of projects and websites on the site speed tool is that there's some reoccurring warnings. Um, and I want to give you guys what those warnings are so that you don't freak out, so that you know how to fix them. The first one that you might see if you're on your computer and you're looking at your site speed test is render, Java, render blocking JavaScript or CSS above the fold. Basically what this means is that above the fold, which is the bottom of this uh, screen here, without having to scroll, what can the user see in, the, in the, the field of vision above the fold? Anything above the fold, Google considers with the utmost priority. So if there's any CSS that's loading um, a little bit slower than the HTML loads, or if there's some JavaScript that's taking a little bit to, to run, um, and it's holding up the rest of the page from loading, this is what Google means when it says render blocking. So when Google renders a page, it works just like you and I do, um, top to bottom. We read from top to bottom. So when uh, Google loads a page uh, or scans a page, it scans it from the top to the bottom. And if you've got a, a main banner at the top that loads, um, if you've got a contact form next that loads or anything that's moving or JavaScript that loads, 
that might not load as fast as some of the HTML that's on that page, just the regular text and all of that stuff. Well, the way um, a synchronous code uh, page loading basically loads from top to bottom in order. The next portion of the page probably doesn't load until the upper portion is displayed properly and is finished loading. And if you've got a piece of JavaScript or CSS or something like that that's a little bit slower, it's holding up the rest of that page from loading. And while that all might happen within a few seconds, and you might not be able to tell a big difference with the human eye, Google's measuring it um, on how fast it's loading. And if it, anything is blocking that page from loading, um, they mark that as a should fix. Okay, so a lot of you might see the same notification, eliminate render blocking JavaScript or CSS. Now the cool thing uh, about this is that you've probably, uh, if you've got this link here on show how to fix, it actually shows you what is, uh, what's blocking or what you should, should move out of the way. Um, and basically what you want to do, and this will take a little bit more research if you're not that technical, uh, and we don't have time to cover it today, but you want the page to load asynchronously. Um, I've just highlighted that word here, and what you'll see in each of these warnings for render blocking is that that is the fix to it. I know there's a couple of WordPress plugins that can do this for you automatically, um, but you've got to get your page loading asynchronously, and that one will go away. Now you can see that red mark is Google saying they think this is a big one. So if you just took care of that one, this page would probably go up a couple of points. And then the next section of, uh, of, of warnings is yellow. And these are sort of the medium important. And this one is browser caching. Looks like images uh, could be optimized further on this website. And then the server response time. So what you do is you go in and you figure out how to fix each of these. Um, you can compress the image. In many cases, you'll have the opportunity to compress the images a little bit further. You might have the uh, server information. You might need to optimize it with your hosting provider or uh, whatever. Um, and you want to keep fixing all of these things. It's not going to happen in one day. Uh, you want to tackle the worst issues first, the reds, and then move from there. Okay, and then the last thing that uh, it shows you are the rules that you did pass. Um, and these are rules like uh, there's no redirects, you've got your CSS minified, uh, the uh, UX and UI is looking good. And you go through each of these things on desktop and mobile and get your website scoring on both of those at 80 or higher. And you'll see a tremendous um, increase in rankings and thus a tremendous increase in traffic. So going back to my presentation and I'm happy to, to answer a few questions at the end um, for you guys and after the end of the call if you want to email me I'm happy to answer any specific technical questions or point you in the right direction but that's the the first hack you're not following Google's mantra site speed and it's hurting your traffic. I've looked at so many uh, SEO projects and they're doing good in SEO, they've got a lot of good content, the blog is really active, um, they're building links, but they just can't overcome, you know, the top two people in the SERPs that are beating them. And in many cases, it's one of these things on this list, one of these hacks. So that's hack number one. Uh, that they reward you for using. If there's any uh, seasoned SEOs in the audience that, that remember uh, the penalties and um, site-wide penalties and page-wide penalties that Google was, was giving uh, years ago, um, then you'll know that this is the only place, what I'm about to show to you, this is the only place that you can sort of communicate with Google um, about specific SEO stuff. Uh, there's only two sort of areas that I've seen Google communicate with, and the first one is when you spend a lot of money on AdWords, <laughs> they'll call you and help you set up the project and do better and encourage you to spend more, and 
And for it seems like it could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like for everything else, they're just like, ah, never mind. Um, and of course, it makes sense that if they're going to do a customer service department for every user, that would be too much of an expense. And specifically for SEOs, they don't want people, um, you know, uh, on purposely attempting to influence their their rankings. Their sort of mantra is. Let's just do as good of content as you can, follow the webmaster tools, and everything will be okay. But we all know, because we're on this call, that there are things that you can do to, to rank higher in the search results. And this communication portal is a gold mine. And what I'm talking about here is Google Webmaster Tools. Uh, now, Google Webmaster Tools, um, I would love to know how many people are using it, um, but Google Webmaster Tools, I found out uh, when I went through all of my customers that 75% of people were not using it, okay? And the truth is, it's our one shot to communicate with the Googlebot. And open communication, just like everything, is way more beneficial than not paying attention to it. So if you're not using Google Webmaster Tools, use it. And if the last time you looked at Google Webmaster Tools was you know, a month ago, then look at it a little bit more. Um, and here are the biggest items in Google Webmaster Tools. Uh, it starts with site links. Um, site links, you can take up more real estate uh, with Google. Faster loading times with schema. If you've got an address, a product, a thought leader, a book, anything like that on your website, you can code it with schema um, and you'll uh, re probably rank better. Um, constantly checking any errors. If you're putting up a, a strong content strategy, you need to check for those errors and then encourage Google to, to index. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this very, very quickly so that this is an actionable only type of webinar. Um, I'm sure you guys have been to a lot of conferences and speeches and have heard a lot of theory. Um, I'm here to talk about actionable stuff, so we'll get to that. Um, but just to make note, in the test that we did, clients have seen a 50% increase in rankings from correcting all of this stuff inside of Google Webmaster Tools. This should be done minimum on a monthly basis by an SEO or, or a developer on your team. And this is one of the fastest ways that you can actually increase rankings. So let me get into uh, the tool here and I'll show you. So I've pulled up uh, Google Webmaster Tools on, uh, on a website here. This is actually my company's website. And there's a couple of awesome things that you can do. Uh, and, and I encourage everybody to get familiar with all of these items on the left-hand menu here. So we're going to just highlight a few that I've found are the most important today. But what you want to get familiar with is all of these areas. And let's start with search appearance. Actually, let's start with messages. This is the actual communications portal. When um, Google penalizes you, when they officially penalize you, or when they tell you, hey, you need to use this tool or uh, you can improve the search presence of Identity Labs, something like that, they're going to do that in this inbox. Okay, so if everybody, anybody that's on the call that's not familiar with this, you install it just like you install Google Analytics. There's a code that you install on your website. Get that installed and then come and look at this message uh, portion. Um, if you've already got it on your website, pull it up right now, take a look at the messages. If there's nothing in there, that's good news uh, because that means you're not penalized. <laughs> um, and then our way to communicate back with Google are in all of these areas down here. So let's start with uh, search appearance. These are all of the areas that you can appear in search, okay? Um, the two that I've found are the most influential in this section are structured data. Structured data is basically schema, and uh, schema is a micro format that you can update your website with. And again, you can do it for an article, you can do it for a profile, you can do it for a product, you can do it for a book. Um, years ago, Google, Microsoft, and um, I believe it was Bing at that time, 
uh, all got together and said, hey, we need some standardization in code so that all of our search results pages will at least recognize some of the information out there equally. And that they came up with schema, which is why it's a .org. All of the codes to implement for schema and the micro formats are on schema.org. Feel free to look it up, and you'll see there's a bunch of things that you can look up and, uh, and mark up with schema. Mark up every opportunity that you have to on your website, and you'll start seeing your rankings go up. The second way to influence uh, Google is to is to take a look at the uh, site links. Now, site links are um, like these. So I'm going to search for that Growth Marketing Conference website again, and it's these. So you know how sometimes when you search for a direct brand, they have an agenda page, a workshop page. Some of them have even more down here. So this is a really great way that you can take up more real estate on Google. And a lot of people aren't uh, paying attention to it. Now, you can't directly enter in which, uh, which URLs that you want Google to have show up. You can't tell Google, hey, display agenda and display workshops. It doesn't work like that. But what you can do is tell Google what you don't want to uh, show up. And that is right here. So in search appearance, site links. Demote this site link URL. Okay, so put your contact us page, unless you want to, to, uh, to have a site link for that, or put your you know, site map page, or all the pages that is, is not very important for someone to take action on your website, put those here. Okay, and that's, what, that's how you can sort of control which links show up, which pages show up on these site links. Uh, areas on, in the search results. Now, what everybody, what we've kind of learned is that Google will take into account the top, um, the top navigation bar, agenda, workshops, sponsor us, blog, contact us. So you can see that they've taken agenda and workshops here and used that. So if you want to, yeah. So if you want to try and influence Google, put the 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 ones the pages that you want to show up the most at the top navigation and over to the left. So you can see it took these two leftmost in the internal pages and put them in the search results. And that's how you can um, influence Google. Now this won't happen over a day. You need to put these up, have Google index the website, um, take a look at it another month. But over a couple of months you can get those site links showing up uh, like you want them to. Okay, so those are the, the two areas like I was describing here in the, uh, in the, in the deck. Site links, um, take up more real estate, faster loading with schema, that one will load faster. Um, another, the, the other two are errors and data highlighter. So the data highlighter is right here and basically what the data highlighter does is it actually shows you um, which areas of your website are similar and lets Google recognize anything that you put up that's, that equals that format uh, in a similar fashion and mark it as a category. And this applies to a blog or an article or a product page. So if you've got products or a blog, you come in here and you can start highlighting all of your pages as a blog and who's the author and what's the date and what's an image and then you tag a set of similar pages and that data highlighter will start really making sure that uh, when you put new pages up Google indexes them very, very quickly and that you're getting the credit that that you deserve in the rankings for those okay and then the last one that we talked about are errors so you can go down to crawl um, crawl stats, this entire section is critical, uh, really mission critical um, for anybody that's trying to direct traffic and sales from the web. All of these crawl stats, if anything is off, it could be affecting your rankings almost immediately. So come in here, take a look at the errors, find out what the error code is, search on Google what the error code is, get it fixed, 
Um, and then you can sort of see when Google crawled your website last, um, what made it do that, what was the average page, what was the high, what was the low, all of that stuff. The, the purpose of this, and you can get Google, you can coax Google into visiting your website um, more. The way that you coax Google into indexing your website is to produce more content. If you think about how Google indexes the web, it's a big area to index, all right? So the, the, they have to put tags on the Googlebot, when should I come back to this website and look at it and index it again? And the way that they decide when to look at it again is how much new content has been updated on this site since the last time that we saw it. So if you update your website and put, you know, let's say four or five blogs up and they see that, um, when previously you had done no blogs for six months, then they might come back a little bit sooner to index your website. And we want Google to be indexing your website as much as humanly possible. Um, because if you're optimizing your website for SEO, if you're putting up new pages, if you're rolling out a content strategy, if you're putting up new products, then all those things are taken into account when Google decides where to rank you. Okay, so the bigger the website is, the better the content is, all of those things determine where you get ranked. Okay, so that's it for uh, the second one. That is hack number two, Google's secret communication portal. As I said, there's a bunch of other stuff in there that you should look at. Um, so take a look on your own, Google Webmaster Tools. I can't emphasize it uh, enough here. The third hack, hack number three, is stealing the uh, traffic from uh, the major competitor in your space. Now, I'm sure everybody's got an idea of who that competitor is. And on the web, the web is interesting because it sort of has somewhat of just open information about uh, your competitor. And it's very difficult to, or traditionally very difficult to, to know where your, where your competitor's customers are, or what they're doing, but there is a way that you can get your, your data and your website and your products in front of competitors' traffic. And this is with link building. And link building as a whole, I'm sure, is not a new concept for anybody on the call, but what we've realized is that the more iterations Google does to the algorithm, the harder it is to rank, the harder it is to build quality links, all of the de-indexing that Google did three or four years ago, it makes it harder. It makes it harder for a novice to be able to find out where should I link from? How do I get these links? Do I buy them? Is that a dirty term? You know, all of this type of stuff. And what we've found is that there's a, a really great white hat way that you can go and laser focus on links that matter. And those are that of your competitors. One of the coolest tools, parts of the, of the tool in SEMrush is that it actually extracts backlinks and it extracts a backlink analysis. Um, so I did, I've got on my screen here, if you're, if you're on another screen you may want to come back and look at this one because we're going to show you where specifically you can get the backlinks from. You may already know this, but um, if you don't, here's what to do. You go and you first decide your biggest competitor. Um, this one that I've looked at here is seoreseller.com. It's uh, my former company, so I know it's got a great backlink portfolio. Um, I helped to build it. <laughs> uh, and a, a, a lot of awesome team members as well. Um, but what you want to do is you find that competitor in your space that has maybe three, four, five steps ahead of you. Um, if you're an e-commerce store, you don't want to use somebody like Amazon as a competitor for this example. They're way too far, or they may be way too far advanced. If they're, if they're tons bigger than you, they're going to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of backlinks and then it won't be appropriate. So you want to find a competitor that is a couple of steps ahead of you. Um, legitimately in success, in age, in tenure, in uh, you know, product offering, 
whatever the case case is, find that competitor and then put them in here and extract their backlinks. Now, let's say your competitor has 1.5 or 1,500 backlinks, just like this one does. This seems like a really good sort of list. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these backlinks, analyze them, and then reach out to those publications and get published at the same place. Now, there's a couple of shortcuts to this that really make the difference, and I want to make this clear. You don't just download blindly this backlink spreadsheet with 1,500 backlinks in it and hand it to somebody and say, okay, get all those backlinks or you just start blindly going down the sheet because not all of them uh, might be appropriate. This is a raw backlink data. Um, so I'm going to show you how to analyze it. And what you want to do, and this is the, the backlink uh, profile downloaded onto uh, a spreadsheet. What you want to do is make sure that all of these ones, uh, all of the target backlinks are appropriate for your website. Okay, so if there's one like this, page not found, traffic shopping.com, or whatever it is, take it out, delete it. Because that's not, you're not going to target that page as a backlink. What you want to do is find, um, and you can sort of tell, find the best backlinks. And you can sort of tell what, what the backlink is all about by looking at the title, which is column B, looking at the source, which is column C and then looking at the, the anchor text, okay? And you can sort by, um, you know, internal links, external links, whatever the case is, but the first run-through that you want to do of this sheet is taking everything off that doesn't look like a good idea. So if it's top SEOs, this is a ranking website of marketing uh, agencies. That sounds like a good idea to go and register for that website, find out how you can become um, featured on that website. Uh, I know from personal experience that you certainly can. So it's just something that you'll have to go and do the research for. But you go, go through these and flag anything that doesn't look like it would be the best backlink for uh, your company and just take it out. Or mark it red and have someone else check it if you want a second opinion. Okay, The end of this should look like, yeah, like these, I don't know what this is. Um, just because it's a different language doesn't mean, necessarily mean that it's a bad backlink, but these I would probably flag and get rid of just to, to be safe. If we've got, you know, 1,500 backlinks to choose from, from that portfolio, then, um, then there's a pretty good chance that we can be uh, very strict on which backlinks we, live, we leave in that list to target. And then what you want to do is go click through to those websites, find out how you can uh, get a backlink. It might be a guest blog. It might be uh, a review website. It might be a number of, of things. And during this process, this is when your good backlinking um, practices and backlinking 101 should I get a backlink from this website? That's when all of that data would come into play. There's a lot of good information out there about that. But the point that I'm making with this hack is that if you can get your, your competition's backlinks, you're basically ha you basically have a roadmap in your hand of where you should backlink. So no more Google searches or anything like that. Now, if you've already done this, then that's a different story, and maybe we can talk later about some additional um, backlink strategies, but this is a surefire way to find a, a list of resources where you can backlink from, and once you start getting those links, you'll start seeing your rankings increase, and you'll be ranked right up there below or above, um, depending on how the two backlink portfolios compare with you and your competitor, and you'll be able to, to start taking some of their traffic, and this is really what it's all about. So this, depending on how long the backlink list is that you've got. This could be a six-month strategy. This could be a year strategy. And what you've got to decide to, to do is how much resources do I have to commit myself to doing these backlinks? How much um, or, or how much resources do I have for other people to be doing them? Like, do I have an intern? Do I have an employee? Can I outsource this? This is the case.
Okay, so this is a good diagram on how to actually visually construct the backlink portfolio. Um, this particular slide isn't new, um, but it's worth reiterating. And if anybody does sort of know this, this slide already, then it's very important that you know it. This is a great guide, simple guide on how to link those backlinks that you're going to be building to your website. Okay, so if you've got the main website, which is yours over there on the left, what we call this next row or column of backlinks is tier one. This is the anything that's connected directly to your website is a tier one backlink because it's got a direct link to your website. So a guest blog or review, a piece of media or press release or something like that, those would all be tier one. But there are other types of, of content that you can put out there that will link back and that will be appropriate. And my point here is whether you're doing a, a feature piece or an infograph, you don't always want to just send the backlink directly back to your website. Sometimes you want to build the reputation of the piece of media that you already got last month. So maybe link to that in your next backlink. And if you can sort of show a comprehensive organic linking structure from tier to tier to website, then this is really going to stand the test of time in terms of Google's algorithms. This is what we've learned. And again, this is just scratching the surface of uh, how a backlink portfolio should be structured. I can get into way more detail. And if you've got questions about that, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, so that, that bottom part gives a great wrap up of basically what this means. Anchor text must be diversified and synthesized randomly to, come, to cover a family of related phrases. And that, that point is basically don't pound at the same keywords. Um, you need to mix it up. There's, you know, five different ways to say one thing and you need to use that and display that in your content and in your backlinks. Um, but for the most part, keywords should always have the root word in them just to make sure that um, Google understands that you want to rank for SEO company San Francisco or whatever the case is. Okay. All right. Now, uh oh, I don't want to leave the webinar. <laughs> we'll cancel that and go on to one of the last hacks that I'm going to be cover today with the time. Um, it looks like there will be one hack left uh, before we run out of time, so I won't be able to cover that one, but I will give this strategy to everybody. Um, and I'll give you the deck, and you can ask me whatever questions that you want. Um, but let's cover this one really quick before we get into the Q&A. And the, the hack here is um, number four, a rising keyword tide raises all ships. And what I was just talking about is a good segue into this about families of keywords and there's different ways to say different things. And basically what I see a lot in SEO is people are um, looking at different keywords. They have their set of 20 that they're very focused on and they just keep including those in the pages, in the blogs, in the link building. And that's great, but it's a little unnatural. And what we want to look at are different ways that we can say the same thing, different phrases, so that it's not an exact replica of the phrase every single time. And what we learned is that there is a, a very small place inside of your Google Webmaster Tools that actually shows you what Google wants to rank you for. So if you've got a limited, let me give this example. You've got five people on your team of the company total. You're in charge of the marketing. You've got a $500 budget for marketing, whether that be uh, you know, an outsourced SEO or whatever the case is. You're probably only going to be able to tackle you know, a few keywords with that type of budget or with the amount of time that you have. How do you know if you should choose the keywords that you know, are the ultimate uh, game changer for you, or should you choose a longer tail keyword uh, that might be a little bit easier for you to rank for? 
And this is how you do it inside of Google Webmaster Tools. So if you've uh, clicked off of the screen, you may want to come back and take a look. I'm going to show you where to find this. Inside of Search Console, I keep calling it Google Webmaster Tools. I think they've changed the name to Search Console, but it's one and the same. So go to Google Webmaster Tools, come down to Search Traffic, and just take a look. Now, again, all of these types of things all, all of these items in here are really interesting to, to look at. Um, but what we're going to be looking at today are search traffic, search analytics, go to uh, impressions and check the box. And then what you'll look at is this list of stuff, keywords down here. On the left hand side is the keyword, on the right hand side is the number of impressions that it made. Now what the number of impression means is the number of times that it showed up in Google's search index when somebody searched for that phrase it's over here. So my website showed up 745 times for SEO agency platform. Okay, and so on and so forth. Now what's interesting is you'll probably see your brand at the top if you're doing, if you're inside of your Google Webmaster Tools and you're looking at this page, you're probably seeing your brand or different versions of your brand name. Forget about those, that's great, but of course you're going to show up a bunch of times for your brand, right? What we're looking for here are good keyword opportunities to include in your blog, to include in your backlink strategy. And the way that we can find those is, I, what I typically tell people to do is go way down to the bottom, maybe even to the next page, and take a look at the keywords that are only getting a few impressions, maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 30 impressions. Take a look at what these keywords are and if they're relevant. Um, Bay Area SEO company, for example, that would be extremely relevant for me, right? But I've only been, I've only been shown in Google search four times for that. What does that tell me? That tells me that Google recognizes that yes, I am a Bay Area SEO company, but for whatever reason, because my page doesn't have it on it, because I haven't blogged about it, because I don't have a really strong link from you know Forbes or whatever coming in to my website with that keyword in it that they've only, showed, they've only uh, shown me four times for that keyword. Now, what you want to do is extract a list, and you can export this list of keywords. What you want to do is, again, in the same practice as with the backlinks, put them on a spreadsheet, take out all the ones that are irrelevant, and focus on the ones that are totally relevant, but you're only, you're only being shown a few times for those. Now these, if you focus on these for your keywords, what you're going to see is all of the keywords will start ranking better. Why? Because Google, you're not challenging Google. You're not saying, Google, we, we want to rank for SEO. You know, that would be my ultimate keyword, right? Or SEO company. But this is very, very difficult to do. And maybe in a similar situation where there might be this, you know, uh, golden keyword that you might not be able to rank for right now and it might not be you might be wasting your time trying to rank for it and if you uh, extracted a really good list of these keywords from this list that keyword might be inside of it like SEO like company like whatever your your main root keyword is um, this is a great way to extract keywords that you can focus on that won't be that hard to rank for and they will rise uh, strategy in your blog strategy and in your content strategy. So to, to look at the, uh, the deck, here's the, the main parts of what you should know. Rising keyword tide raises all ship. Here's how to find the fastest, easiest ways to improve keyword rankings. And from all the testings that we've done, these are the things that matter. The anchor text, 
what does the anchor text actually say? The consistency. Are you being consistent, not with the same exact phrase, but with the same exact family of phrases? And then that indexability is about 70%. And the ahref, the actual link to your website, is it follow, is it not follow? And I did another webinar about anchor text diversity and follow versus no follow and stuff like that. Um, if you want more information on that, I'll pull out that webinar and send it to you. Um, and, and that's where you can find this list of keywords that are much, much easier to rank than, uh, than ones that Google has never heard of from you before. Scaling the unscalable. Uh, this is a great example, visual example, of how to create an assembly line for syndicating backlinks. Um, there's a big process that's involved in acquiring backlinks, like uh, reaching out, creating good content, um, uh, and just securing the link, making sure that it's there. Um, and do that, you'll need uh, starts and stops with an intern or a VA or a combination of tools. And then hack number five is exactly me telling you what tools uh, that I use to create that assembly line. Um, I'll leave that for the folks that want to take a look at the, uh, at the deck. It was just the last slide there with a list of tools. You're welcome to, uh, to, to leave it, but I wanted to uh, open the floor to any questions and I'm happy to take specific questions. And wanted to also let you know that uh, Neil Patel and I are doing a, a virtual summit coming up October 17th. If you're on his list, you may have gotten a, um, an email about it, but I want to invite everybody to, to go to that. It's 30 plus best marketing speakers, and we're excited about it. Um, so with that, uh, Patrick, do you have any questions that uh, the folks want to, to hear answers to? Definitely. We've got a lot of questions coming in, and just real quick, I'm going to send out couple of links here. Uh, you can find information here on our upcoming webinars. We've got next week uh, Rocco Baldassari is joining us on Tuesday, October 4th. Uh, events. We are currently in New York City at SMX East. Our team is there for the next couple days. And that final link there, uh, the bit.ly link, is for a trial of the SEMrush platform. So anyone that is interested, this poll here will just expedite the process. And while you're fi uh, filling that out, We'll dive right into the questions here. Um, first one is, do you have any advice on fixing uh, the site speed for shopping carts uh, like bigcommerce.com? I don't know specific answers for bigcommerce.com, but I'm assuming that some of the challenges that people could be having with site speed for e-commerce websites might be attributed to uh, the platform. If you're on a platform that doesn't allow you to change things about the TLD, about the root domain speed or the server speed or anything like that, that could be holding you back. Um, I'm not sure what your reasons are for using big commerce, um, but if they are greater then your need to get the site speed running, then stay there. But if you think you can go to another platform where you are in full control of every aspect of the site speed, then I may recommend changing if uh, I was a little bit deeper into that guy's situation. It's a great question. I've that a lot and uh, this question a lot and I, I just keep going back to just seems like nine times out of ten it's something that's not in your control. They won't let you update the metadata or they won't change the JavaScript or you know whatever the case is and if if it's holding you back I mean you gotta make a decision on is it worth it or not it depends on how much sales uh, are potentially gained from organic search and there, I'm sure there's a ton of sales that are potentially gained from organic search so tough decision but if you want to talk about it a little later I'm happy to take a look at the actual site and I'll be able to tell is it you or is it them or <laughs> who's who's to blame Excellent advice. Uh, we've got plenty of questions here. This next one, uh, we, we had a couple of people actually asking about uh, if there is a preferred schema language 
whether it's RDFA, Microdata, or uh, JSON-LD? You know, a lot of, it's a great question. A lot of people um, get really into the technical details, um, but what we've found is that in the last couple of years, it doesn't matter. There's not a preferred schema language. Um, in fact, a lot of things, if you look, um, there's a lot of things that five years ago were a very relevant thing to know or to live by, but Google has made leaps and bounds in uh, their ability to index almost anything. So there's n it doesn't matter, especially in the, the microdata. Um, in this one, either one of those, uh, all of those are fine. And the, and the way to test it, sorry to interrupt, but the way to test it would be use one on one page and another one on the other page and see if there's any different in, in indexing. And I, I'm sure there won't be. All of it. So, can WordPress sites be mi uh, marked up with with schema and micro formats? And if so, is there a plugin uh, that you can recommend for this? Yeah, they can be. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what type of uh, content you've got on your WordPress website, like on my WordPress website, is you know it's an agency site, so there's what we do, and there's a lot of blogs, so I've got all the blogs marked up. Um, but I didn't use a plugin, um, and I've never recommended a plugin for uh, for marking up on WordPress. Just because I know there are a few, but there's nothing that I would put my name on, not because I've had a problem with them, just because I want to stay. Uh, diplomatic, but you know the best tool I would recommend is just going in and uh, looking at the data highlighter in Google Webmaster Tools and going from there. Excellent. Uh, if you have too many 3-in-1 redirects due to page not found errors you're trying to minimize, uh, is there a better approach to uh, avoid Google penalties for, for those redirects? Other than getting rid of them or lessening them, no. I mean, that would be the, the main idea. It sounds like you, your uh, mind is in the right place. Um, I'm not quite sure. Of course, there's unique situations why you wouldn't be able to try and think of ways that why you wouldn't be able to uh, remove them or lessen them. Maybe if you've got a previous website that was really good in SEO and you don't want to get rid of those, um, that would be one reason that you don't want to just cut them all. Um, but I would figure out a way to, like, over a period of months, scale back on them in a significant way. This one, we, we had a couple of comments about this, and um, I know it, it seems to be a common problem. Uh, one of our users said, my index shows 42 pages out of uh, 147 index. What could be mm -hmm. the cause, and is, is that something you should worry about fixing? No, you shouldn't worry about fixing it. It might be something where uh, at one time you had more pages on your website or Google index the uh, yoursite.com slash robot.txt or some uh, piece of code that's not actually a page. Uh, what you want to be a little bit more concerned with is uh, your sitemap versus the index. So are there the same amount of pages that are actually on the sitemap that are in the index? And the exception to that rule would be just if you have an area of the site that you don't want in Google's index. That would be the exception. So sitemap versus indexed pages. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're a little tight on time today, everyone. And we're just going to close out with one last question. Uh, but I did keep track of all of these. And uh, if, if you do have more questions, feel free to reach out to Clayton. The information is all on the screen here. Uh, if you're using a template website such host such as Squarespace, is there anything that can be done to increase site speed? Uh, yeah, it probably will require moving it to another host. And this is what I touched on very briefly earlier. If you've got um, a provider that doesn't allow you to control all the aspects of the site speed, starting with the server and everything, um, then it might be holding you back. And this is a common one, and this is why, you know, um, a lot of people won't use those services, even though they might be good for user interface or, um, you know, just being friendly. Um, might not be the best thing. If the score is low, then 
depends on your ability, your uh, technical ability to move to uh, something of your own. Um, but in general, yeah, there's probably nothing you can do about it. And uh, Clayton, just to close out here, is there more information on the uh, upcoming event that you have with Neil on your website? Uh, no, there's not. But um, uh, I'll, I'll put uh, a piece of information on the link uh, in the last slide so that everybody can see it. And you can also, you can also find it at summit dot neilpatel dot com summit dot neilpatel dot com. It's a virtual summit on October seventeenth, and they're hosting it together with uh, thirty of the thirty plus of the top um, marketers in the country. It's about growth hacking secrets, and it's free if you want to watch it live. Um, but if you want a lifetime pass, there's a, a charge there. But you'll you'll see all of that information on the summit dot neilpatel dot com. And uh, Patrick, it's always a pleasure, man. I love being with you. Definitely. Wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, thank you on behalf of our audience. I know we got some great engagement today, some wonderful information shared. So I hope everyone goes out and experiments with this and uh, sees some wonderful results with their marketing efforts. I'd love to answer as many of those questions as I can. So everybody that's still listening, feel free to send them to me, claytonwood at gmail.com, and we'll... We'll get you helped out. Great. Thanks again, Clayton. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.